Welcome back to Bay Sunday. Our political expert, Melissa Griffin Kane, had an opportunity to talk to Congressman Eric Swalwell on all things politics, of course, from the Bay Area, the Capitol Hill. Let's take a listen. Um, so recently, the Democratic Party has come under fire. The, the, the big number out now is that the average age of Democratic Party leadership at 64, I believe, is the, is the age that I saw. And now, you are a younger member, of course, maybe the youngest uh, in, the, in the Democratic caucus. The youngest Californian. The youngest Californian. Yeah. Okay. So in your estimation, does it matter that the party leadership uh, is, is so much older? And is that part of why we saw so few people, so few young people turn turning out to vote this last time? I think right now a big problem is that young people are not engaging. Uh, they uh, are very uh, apathetic. They don't see uh, why their engagement can make a difference, and that really does concern me, especially here in the Bay Area. Bay Area. We have so many young entrepreneurs, so many people in this innovation economy who really rely on uh, government uh, to make decisions that are going to enable that, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not participating, and that really does uh, concern me. So when you look at the leadership in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. uh, I think it's part of my responsibility to, you know, really stand up and represent the millennial generation uh, and the generation that wants to make sure that they have access uh, to a higher education, that when they get their degree, there's going to be a good job for them uh, out there. And so in the congressional leadership, I don't think it is as important, you know, how old the leadership is. Mm -hmm. I think it's the mindset. Do you represent uh, the mindset that is really defining this new economy. And that's a mindset that I think is one that's collaborative and more uh, horizontal rather than uh, top-down vertical. Nancy Pelosi asked me uh, this week to serve, uh, Leader Pelosi asked me to serve uh, on a leadership committee that uh, will advise uh, her. And so I think, you know, giving me a, a seat at the table and a voice for my generation uh, shows that she's going to work in a collaborative uh, way. And so I, I do appreciate that. Oh, well, that's good to hear. Uh, so you are you just got reelected for the first time. Um, I'm so fascinated by what it must be like to be a, a young congressman in Washington, D.C. Is there, I picture like a grizzled old veteran calling you aside <laughs> and showing you how things work. Is, is that the case? Has somebody taken you, in, or, or more than one person taken you under their wing to sort of show you the ropes down there? Congressman George Miller, he mm -hmm. just retired. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got a few more weeks before uh, he is uh, in retirement, he served 40 years, yeah. and he came to Congress about the same age that I did. And I'll never forget uh, my first day in Washington, D.C. for orientation. Uh, he found me, uh, you know, among the members and came up to me. And I had run against uh, one of his friends, uh, Congressman Stark, and George Miller said to me, he said, Eric, I want you to know that, uh, you know, you're one of the younger ones here. You ran against one of our colleagues, uh, but you're not half a member. You're not three quarters of a member. You're a full member here, and I don't want you to feel like you don't belong because you belong here. And so I, he has taken me under his wing uh, in many ways. But you know, I went there a little sheepish, not knowing what to expect, you know, wondering if I was going to be an outcast. And the way that uh, George Miller, you know, took me uh, in and advised me and helped me, I really did appreciate. And it was actually, it was really, uh, it was a little sad when he announced he was retiring. But he said he felt ready to pass this on to the next generation. And so I felt like he's given me the tools that I need now uh, to lead. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be for 40 years. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's got a long uh, term of service. But uh, I, I do think that he has helped me uh, get ready uh, to lead the next generation. Well, that's really nice. Uh, what have you, what's the most surprising thing that you learned when you got there? What's something that you were really taken aback by or thought was really weird? Biggest surprise for me since being there uh, is, frankly, how poorly uh, we treat our veterans. Our mm -hmm. office. Uh, works on hundreds of veteran cases and you know I knew that the system uh, was really overloaded uh, mm -hmm. but when you talk to the veterans in our district uh, you know it's so frustrating because they kept their end of the bargain they went and served uh, their country and then they come back home and the resources are limited the wait times are long uh, the care is not the quality we expect and so that's really I think one of the biggest uh, surprises and uh, this is, again, where I'm trying to use, I think we can use technology to better serve, especially our Afghanistan and Iraq veterans. If you tell them you have to call and make an appointment or you have to go down there and make an appointment, they're like, we don't do anything over the phone anymore. I don't even know if my, you know, I don't even know what the ring uh, sound is on a phone. I mean, they, <laughs> you know, they text, they use mm -hmm. their mobile devices uh, mm -hmm. to make appointments and, uh, you know, get things done. And so, you know, just really, I think, representing that generation uh, is important to me and pushing government uh, to be uh, more tech savvy.
Okay. Well, before we go, I do want to ask you about um, the immigration issue. We know yeah. uh, the president recently issued his executive order. Wanted to ask you quickly, what do you what do you think of that use of power? You're an attorney. Mm -hmm. You you yeah. understand sort of the the legal underpinnings or not of this, um, and how you see this issue playing out in mm -hmm. Congress. We are a great country of opportunity and prosperity because we have embraced immigration, not mm -hmm. because we have turned immigrants away. And right now, with 12 million undocumented people uh, in our country. I think what the president did was he said to them, he can't make them citizens with this executive order. Only Congress can do that. Mm -hmm. But what he can do with the discretion that he has is allow them to not live in fear. And I can't imagine what it's like every morning to get up and not know if this is the day that you're going to be deported from our country, to drive by a police officer on the road and cower or fear that you could be pulled over uh, you know, for a brake light not working or you know, going a little over the speed limit and all of a sudden you're going back to your country of origin. So I, I think what he's done uh, is limited. It allows them uh, to be here uh, in, a, in a deferred way until hopefully Congress passes uh, an, an immigration bill. We have to pass an immigration bill. The Senate, with almost 70 votes, passed a bill that puts immigrants on a roadmap to citizenship where if you take a background check and pass it, you pay a fee over a certain period of time, you can become citizens. Now it's time for the House to do that and the president's limited in what he can do. But I think taking that fear away from people is very important. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. For Bay Sunday, I'm Melissa Griffin King. Thank you, Melissa. He's got Bay Area roots and he's been here before. He's sitting in the chair right over there. Up next, comedian Hannibal Thompson. When we come back, stay right there.